Welcome to this broadcast, this teaching that we're doing. And what we're doing uh, on this is we're going to go over just the first part of Revelation 13 um, in the kind of intro or the approach to understanding the great event or the great process that unfolds at the end of time. Revelation 13 is the process that creates the Revelation 14 remnant people. And so it's very uh, uh, important that we understand that Revelation 13 is the machine, is the fuller soap, is the very conditions, the very workshop, the kitchen which God cooks and makes his, quote, remnant, his 144,000, those who are prepared, washed, cleaned, and brought through a process to stand before God. And so how important is it to understand the process and not lose heart, not lose hope, not lose faith and trust and dependence upon God, and not to misunderstand and misinterpret to have Satan access our abandonment and rejection and alienation issues, thinking that God has forsaken us when God is provoking us to faith. This is the key of faith to really understand that you have to fix your gaze and get literally locked in to what is true in heaven and not what's true in the experiences around you, not to receive those messages sensually, experientially, existentially from the happens stances and the happenings where you derive your happiness of the happened circumstances that are in this life. This life and this world is not always God's narrative to you. If it were true, then Christ was rejected of the Father because the Pharisees didn't like him or leadership didn't like him or whatever. Not true. So what is faith, genuine faith, the kind of faith that prevails, the faith that triumphs in the end has nothing to do with receiving messages and being integrated into this world. But in fact, Satan is going to attack God's people and God's people are going to have to understand like the book of Daniel and have their eyes open with eye salve, unlike Laodicea and have their vision fixated on what is so in heaven to understand God's workings, God's purposes. And to understand as when he uh, allowed the children of Israel to be brought to Babylon for a 70-year cleansing program where God is trying to convince us, saying, it's not a bad thing that I'm putting you in there because you're going to learn. My heart towards you is good. I know my thought towards you. I know that what I am doing is for your total benefit. This is important to understand. So what I want for us to do is understand that when we get into this study on, quote, standing on the sand of the sea, what do we see? We see this beast rising from the sea. We need to understand that is cueing us in the study of the scripture why every detail of the book of Revelation is trying to point you, bounce you, get you to to literally react in a kind of impulse to go back to the Old Testament to see where this imagery comes from. And sometimes we have to stop and just orientate ourselves on, quote, I stood on the sand of the sea. And don't go past that at 70 miles an hour, careening into parked cars and just squealing your tires to get out of that neighborhood. You have to stop and smell the roses on some of these so you can get orientated. And these are the times in which we should be totally clear and orientated as to what is God saying to us when he's using the imagery that he's using. And what we're going to look at today is what does it mean to stand on the sand of the sea? And then we're going to, of course, just only touch on the beast that rises up. That's not going to be the big focus. We have to understand just the context of standing on the sand of the sea, and what does that imply? What is that telling us? What are the circumstances? What is the issue at hand? What is the opening salvo of this chapter 
that is trying to um, inculcate or tell us or teach us or to cue our minds because scripture is trying to give us context. What may appear to be God's rejection might ex uh, actually be God's process of polishing his jewels to prepare them to make the very garment of that bride white and without wrinkle or without spot or any such thing like that, but to, to cooperate with that purification process that Esther had to go through before her marriage to her king and later on a death decree, etc. So please understand that this is what we're trying to do. Hey, Brother Steve, good to see you. What we're trying to do is understand the mind of God, the workings of God, and these are end time events, the eschatological context in which God is operating that we should not, quote, have false, wrong-headed expectations of God, but actually understand what the Lord is doing. The scripture is abundant with insight. So what you're going to see on the, quote, stand to the sea stuff is God is consistent. When God is using the context of the sand of the sea, it is totally consistent with what? Trial, inheritance, to come into inheritance and the trials that come when inheritance is going to be established. And then you have the shaking, the pulverizing, the, the crushing into sand. And this process of standing on the sand of the sea is going to be a very fascinating insight into God creating a remnant. God creating inheritors and the trials and challenges and the dispute over inheritance that the imagery of sand of the sea is accessing. This is important. So without further delay, let's get into the imagery of, quote, the sand of the sea, and we'll go from there. Does that make sense? Keep me in prayer as we go through this. So as I stood on upon the sand of the sea. Saw a beast rise up out of the sea because this is also kind of going to be this imagery because we're going to see that this is a creation imagery, right? You have the land rising up from the sea. So you're going to have this kind of imagery of creation, but also you're going to see something too, that God threw something into the sea. That will be accessed in the imagery too, and then you're going to have from the sand of the sea this reemergence. What did God throw into the sea? For further study, but to keep your mind in that thinking biblical direction. And it says, I saw beasts rise up out of the sea, having seven heads, ten horns, and upon his horns, ten crowns, and upon his heads, the name of blasphemy. We're going to see the entire culmination of the imagery of Daniel, of all those kingdoms brought together into this amalgamated beast in which it, it is the kind of the, the snowball of all of this and it's inheritance time and the fight in the war of inheritance. So you're going to see this beast now going to go to war with the lamb, war with the remnant of the seed, war with the uh, kingdom of heaven, and it is definitely accessing the stand of the sea inheritance and the strife and the um, challenge of inheritance that that imagery evokes. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard. It's a Hellenistic beast. Its body was a spotted like leprosy. Its feet were as the feet of a bear, kind of like how Persia armies, you know, moved and lumbered forward. His mouth was the mouth of a lion, right? Like Satan, a roaming seeking in whom he could devour with his authority in this way. Lion is always in the imagery of the lion of the tribe of Judah, which is the law shall not depart from Judah. And the dragon gave him power, seat, and great authority, satanic, moving through his proxy, you know, uh, uh, instrumentality. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death. Now, this is a comeback beast. It's cast into the sea, excuse me, cast into the sea, emerges from the sea. And his deadly wound was healed 
And all the world wandered after the beast and they worshiped the beast and gave and gave power unto the beast. And they worshiped the beast saying, who is like unto the beast? And we're going to touch on what that phrase evokes a little bit, just to kind of give us context. This is always in reference to God and his power, his dominion, his authority, uncontested dominion of God to be the true inheritor. And this is the language of who is like unto the Lord. Now, this is a beast and we have a sand of the sea situation and it's emerging and it's almost primordial creature creation kind of a mode to establish dominion upon this earth. Yeah. Very epic kind of picture to try to get a hold of. Who is able to make war with him? That's the essence of the word Michael. It's in other studies. When God goes to war, the question is, who is like unto God? Who's able to make war with God? Mikhail. Who can who can do what God does? Who can be like God when God is now contesting you? Just like he put Job up on the court stand and says, you have a case against me? You going to you going to bring your lawyer against me and think you could stand? God is uncontested. Nobody can bring a charge against God. This is the quality that the beast now asserts and dawns upon himself, wears this robe and officiates with this authority and power for the final takeover of full dominion inheritance through war follow follow this so what is this idea of quote i stood on the sand now when you stand on sand it's a precarious place god says stand upon the rock shalom shayla shalom so what is this why is he standing on the sand of the sea it's a very precarious place to stand. We know that God admonishes us to stand upon a rock. But this is what it's like to look at the affairs of this world. And if you look at the book of Daniel, Daniel became sick for many days and he was without strength because he was looking at the beast power. When God kept saying, keep on looking till the stone was cut out without hands. Keep on looking till 2000, uh, 2,300 evening morning Yom Kippur's. Keep on looking till the judgment was set. The books were open and the Ancient of Days was seated. And the Son of Man goes up to the Ancient of Days to receive inheritance. This is all talked about the same event. Keep on looking until Jesus Christ advocates for us as a heavenly high priest on the Day of Atonement to now uh, put in the names of the Lance Book of Life for the final registry to prepare for his coming and then there's the agitation there's the process of inheritance there's a great call to the everlasting gospel it creates a great shaking it creates a great uh, time of trouble and through that process through the trials and the affliction and the crucible that god's people will go through it will purify and purge them in which they will be weaned of this world and lay a hold of the infinite righteous robes of Jesus Christ as their heavenly high priest, kind of like around the the uh, hem of the garment of the high priest where you had the golden bells, the great, great proclamation of eternal, everlasting, infinite righteousness through your high priest and the pomegranates, which are all the promises and this idea of the rosy cheeks, the pomegranate cheeks of the bride that is shamefaced and she enters in through the bridegroom and in our humility, you have the kind of seeds packed in blood, trust in the bridegroom and his merits and his inheritance. And it's this humility march by hanging on to the hem of his garment, such as the woman that held on to the hem of his garment. And then she was healed of her issuing curse or Ruth and when she brought the hem of Boaz's garment over her. And this is an indication that she's now under the covering, under the chupa of her husband in which she calls herself by his she defers herself to him to his name so keep on looking till that but we have a prophet saying this is what it's like to stand on the sand of the sea so let's take a look at that so matthew 7 24 26 29 says therefore whoever hears these things of mine and does them i'll be like unto him 
uh, to a wise man who built his house on the rock, which is Christ. The one who was cut out without hands, who came and was sent, and he is the foundation, the stone is stumbling, the rock of offense, the infinite righteousness of God in which we could, quote, trust and rest and have our standing with God based on the eternal qualities of Christ. Anyone want to contest that? God help us. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does them will... um, yeah, who hears and, and uh, does not do them will be like the foolish man who built on the sand. You see, Satan is counting on you standing on the sand of the sea. Standing on who are the who and we're going to get into who is the sand of the sea? Who is considered sand and who is considered rock? A lot of people think that if I have enough people in my fellowship, I have enough friends, if I find enough people to agree with me, why are you building on the quote Sand on your denominational affiliation, on your congregation, on your friends, on your prayer circle, on the people that uh, make up the constituency of the community of faith that you're a part of. You don't build on that. You don't build on spiritual formation and on this whole idea of uh, this spiritual community concept. You build on Christ. Verse 27, and the rain descended, rain, the Holy Spirit, a shaking. It rains on the just and unjust. To some, it's a flood of destruction. To another, it's a blessing upon dry crops. Same event, two different experiences. The floods came, the winds blew. What, the four winds that blew upon the world? And then all the agitation happened. All the beasts are rising up out of the sea. Come, O north wind, come, O south wind. And then you have this great agitation that brings us into the bridegroom's chambers of the Song of Solomon, the king of the north, the king of the south, and the extreme winds that create the conditions like when Paul, after the Day of Atonement, was traveling to Rome and the trials that he went through in order to prepare him to face Caesar, the, quote, beast of this world, and beat on the house. What house? Like Paul's journey, like that beat on the ship? The house of God that be what whatever the whatever house, whatever structure, whatever institution, whatever we think makes up structure, and it fell, and great was its fall. And so it was when Jesus had ended these sayings that the people were astonished at his teaching. Because he said, Build, wait, stand on the rock, build on the rock, so you're not washed away. For he taught them as one having authority, not as the scribes and the masters of theology and the doctors of theology and all the people that are in these kind of high stratosphere positions administratively within the church. David, I think you're too harsh. No, I think the scripture is clear. So let's also look at the imagery of this, who can make war with him? Who could make war with him is a title ascribed to God. But yet Satan is now presenting himself when you're standing on the sand of the sea. Who can make war with him? He's the God of this world. He's a prince of the power of this atmospheric miasma and this kind of global brain. This newest fear, this this mental consciousness that's out in this world in which we all fear and tremble. This is Leviathan asserting himself. Who can make war with him? Only title that belongs to God. God is the man of war. Who can make war with him? Well, let's see about a, about a power that was thrown into the sea. Let's see if the Egypt Exodus theme that's in Revelation has any bearing to this imagery at all. Then saying Moses, Exodus 15, verses 1 to 3, and the children of Israel, this song unto the Lord. I sang a new song. Does this have anything to do with Revelation and the 144,000 that they sing a new song? And he spoke saying, I will sing unto the Lord for he has triumphed gloriously. See, Satan is trying to truly assimilate like all good narcissists do. You know how they just assimilate the very thing that they're going to war with. They want to take all of its majesty and all of its glory. They want to ascribe those qualities to themselves. What a narc. What a satanic narc. What a cosmic crazy narc he is. I know I'm going to get in trouble by Satan for saying that, but hey, 
we're, we're going to be in trouble. The horse and his rider, he's thrown into the sea. What's this coming up out of the sea again? We're staying at, this, at the other side on the shore, and we're now seeing something rise up out of the sea. Uh-oh. Pharaoh rising again. The Lord is my strength and song. He has become my salvation. He has become. He is the way, the truth, the life. He is the reality of that in my stead as my substitute rock surety. He is the anchor beyond the veil. He's the reality of that, that I could put my hope, not in my circumstances, not on the sand of the sea, my feelings and experience uh, and, and all the shifting sand ropes of sand promises that we have always moving, always shifting. He is my God. He is my salvation. And I will prepare him a habitation where? He's gone to prepare a place for us. Where do you prepare a habitation for God? It's called faith. It's called loving him. It's called when he knocks, you let him in, and then he will come and sup with us, and then we give him a place to rest on our bosom like the Shulamite in the Song of Solomon. My father is God, and I will exalt myself as I preach in front of the congregation because I have low self-esteem. Oh, I'm sorry. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I'm sorry. I'm I got lost with all the other pastors that use the pulpit to fulfill their self-esteem. Let me restate that. My father, I will exalt him, Christ. Not my own. I wasn't breastfed as a child. My inner child has never been healed. I need validation by people being um, fanboys of my preaching. That, that's a whole different message. The Lord is a man of war, Yahweh living reality and being nothing exists without the reality of God speaking into existence because he's self-sustaining he's self-actualizing self-realized he is who he is he is life and God in eternity he's the reality of those things and that's who came down to die for you and for me and to advocate for us what a sure rock that is Yahweh is his name is his character is his personhood but let's keep reading on in this kind of Egypt deliverance thing that I know that the book of Revelation is accessing. I mean, it's delivered by plagues, etc. Verse 10 of Exodus 15, you blew with your wind. Oh, we have something and we have sand and rock. The sea covered them. They sank like lead in the mighty waters. Who is like unto you? Does this sound like Revelation 13? One who is like unto this beast? Oh, Lord, among the gods, Satan, sitting in the seat of God, acting as if he is God, assuming and ascribing to himself the qualities and characters, the title and the authority and the position of God. Men love that position, too. We have fantasies of our divine authority. Who is like unto you? You see the imagery that's being accessed by this beast? This is the this is Satan's comeback, you guys. This he's mad for what God did to Pharaoh. He's mad for what God did to Babylon. He's mad for what God did to the Amalekites. Whatever that was, his vassal proxy of uh, instrumentality that he was using on Earth, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders. You stretched out your hand, the earth swallowed them, and in your mercy have le led forth the people whom you have redeemed. You guided them in your strength to your holy habitation. That's the context. Satan knows that God is about to bring his people, his redeemed, those that were saved through the mercy seat and through the throne of grace, because of the advocate and our heavenly high priest imputing his infinite righteousness in our in our behalf, he says, you guided them in your strength to your holy mountain, which represents the throne of God in heaven. Satan knows what's up. Satan knows what time it is. Do you? Do I? Do we? Does the church? Or are we just going along to get along? Not realizing Satan is asserting his inheritance. He's going for it. He's grasping it. He is seizing it through violence, like John the Baptist talked about. 
Deuteronomy 33, verse 29 says, happy are you, O Israel, God's people, those in covenantal relationship with God. Who is like you? When God goes to war and he asserts his own power and authority, you know, to be the father of the redeemed children and to grant them the inheritance of eternal life. A people saved by the Lord, the shield of your help and the sword of your majesty, how Satan would love to vision himself as some majestic power bearing sword and shield of authority and dominion and power. And so here's a part of Satan's fantasy. Your enemy shall submit to you and you shall tread down the high places. That's what God does to his enemy. Satan is still in his maniacal fantasy to LARP live action role play to do a cosplay to wear the costume thinking that he's God roaming the earth and he's going to shed some serious blood these days. You don't believe it? Hey, wait 15 minutes. Let's see how this all plays out. We're not going to have to wait long anymore, right? Psalms 71 verses 19 and 20 says, also your righteousness, O God, is very high. Praise God. This is the orientation of the Christian and that is fixing your eyes upon your heavenly high priest who's gone up into the ancient of days, imputing his righteousness, and through his perfect personhood and the righteousness that he's attained within his own self, he imputes that to those who come to him by faith. That's how you overcome the beast. That's how you overcome the image. That's how you overcome the number. That's how you overcome the mark of the beast. This is how you overcome is through your advocate, who has gained rightful inheritance and he is eternally righteous. It's called righteousness through or by faith. I have a lot of Christians going to war with me on that saying, no, we're not righteous by faith. We're righteous by infusion of mystical experiences. All right, creepy. All right, sensualist. All right, humanist. All right, Luciferian. Got it. You have done great things, O oh God, who is like unto you? You see, these are the titles. Amen. Imputation is our is the reality that God needs to say we're righteous. God cannot look at Abraham and say, yeah, this guy's going to have a ton of babies. He can't look at Sarah's womb and says ton of babies. He's saying you're dead and the reality exists within me. I am the reality of this. God is looking for reality. He's not looking for people wearing costumes. He's looking for people that are saying, look at me according to the reality of the eternal one, Jesus Christ, in whom you have spent infinity with, and you know that he's the really real deal. His righteousness is real, not my pretended fake righteousness. I don't want to bring the righteousness of Cain. I don't want to bring the righteousness of creature merit. It was like unto you, Christ is unique in his righteousness. In righteousness, does thou judge and make war. In righteousness, he needs righteousness standing in front of him. Who is my righteousness? You, your experience, what channeled through you? Let's end all this spiritualistic, mystical nonsense in which it's only going to disqualify us because it, it will be nothing more than the offering of Cain. Verse 20 says, you who have shown me great and severe troubles shall revive me again and bring me up again from the depths of the earth. This is the picture of what Lucifer, Satan, is trying to do in this beast rising again renewal thing of rising up out of the sea. Hey, you cast fair on the sea? I'm back, baby. You destroy Nimrod? I'm coming back and Babby Lawn. Everything, Satan thinks he's the comeback kid. And he does it even on a second resurrection after a thousand years in which the saints are dead and asleep. And then Satan rules with his uh, angels on earth. And you should read the Hebrew on that. They are terrified. They are in a prison cell. It's very interesting when you want to go in the Old Testament and understand what the pelican means, what the porcupine means, and all these things, what, 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 the, what the horned owl is, and all this other kind of stuff. It's describing the emotional state that these demons are in while they are stuck in toho boho. When the earth is held on pause after its destruction, it's a prison house. 
And then they are risen again upon the return of Christ like a crown jewel and a bride coming down from heaven. They're raised up again. They go to war with the lamb. And what do you realize? Satan thinks he's the comeback kid again. Psalms 113, praise the Lord. Praise, oh, the servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Wow. Sounds like three persons of the Godhead. Blesses the name of the Lord. From the time, from this time forth, from the rising of the sun to its going down, the Lord is his name to be praised. The Lord is high above all nations. His glory is above the heavens. You're going to see that Satan is trying to ascribe all these titles to himself. We're building up. This is going to crescendo in who is like unto you? Who can make war with you, God? And Satan's like, my turn. And we stand on the sand of the sea. We're like, wow, inheritance time. And Satan is now looking to seize it through an epic, epic power grab. Are we poised for that now? Who is like unto, right? Who is like the Lord our God who dwells on high, who humbles himself to behold the things that are in the heavens and in the earth? God's humility is what makes him great. Satan is a maniacal cosmic narcissist that is constantly hyping himself. When we actually see him, it's going to be, this is the one who made the nations tremble. And we freaked out at him saying, yeah, it's kind of weird that that weaselly weird dude, that's kind of creepy. Yeah, we were freaking out over him. We They bought into his power, into his hype. Yeah, he's kind of a ham. You know, he was he's able to really get people to rally around his image and to be defenders, you know, the flying monkeys to the cosmic narcissist going around and making sure that everyone submits to the cult of personality that he wants to be. Not that human beings kind of do that stuff on earth or you see that in the church. I'm just saying. He raised, this is Christ. He raised the poor from the dust. Satan and his children, as you will see through Moab, and we get further into this, we're going to do like a three-part series on this, that uh, this is the children of Moab, and God has to humble them because of their pride. And endlessly, the children of Satan are children of pride, the children of display, the children of adornment, the children of self-glorification, the children of truly without a conscience. And they, they tear you apart with their mouth and with their words, and these are lawless ones that have no love of the truth, and they love delusion. List the needy out of the ash heap that he may seat him with princes, with the princes of his people. He grants the barren woman a home like Sarah, imputation like a joyful mother of children, praise the Lord. So let's look at the troubles that come from the sand of the sea. Perspective. To stand on the sand of the sea and watch the beast rise. Watch the comeback of Satan. It was a deadly wound thrown into the sea. And now Satan emerges with more power than ever. He's something out of Pirates of the Caribbean. And the Black Pearl is now rising. And everyone's like, what is this warship, right? So Job. But Job answered and said, this is when God is indicting him, saying, okay. Uh, answer. Oh, that my grief were thoroughly weighed. Are you ready for the time of trouble? You ready for the great trial that's going to come upon human beings? Are you ready for Satan to contest those that are inheritors of what Christ has promised through faith in him that he says you're going to inherit the world? You're going to inherit eternal life. You're going to inherit a new heaven, a new earth. Satan knows this. He knows it better than Christians do. Christian thinks that that what we inherit is amazing fellowship, awesome events that happen up on the pulpit, and the best possible coffee and donuts you can get when you come through the lobby. I'm not just picking on that stuff. You guys, we're just we're not really seizing these epic realities of what our true inheritance is. So it says, Oh, that my grief, my grief were thoroughly weighed. Get ready for the time of trouble. My calamity laid in the balances together. Be prepared for the sand of the sea. For now, it would be heavier than the sand of the sea. 
Get ready. You're going to see this as the theme of inheritance and the trial and tribulation that comes when you stand on the sand of the sea in this inheritance time. How Satan is going to contest it and look to seize the inheritance. And it will be a storm. It will be a wind. It will be a rain. And it will be things that are all washed away from this great trial in which there is a cosmic scuffle a great conflict in which Michael Christ, who is like unto God, wars with him who says, who is like unto the beast, who is like unto the creature, who is like unto that which was created and has now become the freak show of an amalgamated beast and is now taking all the qualities of the beast and then turning creation against God, the freak show beast. And we're going to have to sit there and theater this with our eyeballs and with our soul as we see this freak creature coming from the primordial waters to now challenge the judgment of God. Yeah, here we go. So, therefore, my words are swallowed up. It's a great time of trial. For the arrows of the Almighty are within me, the poison where, uh, uh, whereof drinketh up my spirit, the terrors of God do set themselves in array against me. This is sand of the sea time, guys. And inheritance is at stake. It's become the central issue here. Satan's at war. And when you know something about the scripture, the the, um, imagery of the scripture, the sides of the north is a picture of God's throne, his high and uplifted throne, which Satan is looking to contest that, looking to um, unthrone God and to unseat God and to replace God, and to rule as God, and to have dominion, and he wants to be as God where he executes the death penalty. Satan's lust to be as God, his weird, sick, twisted fantasies to be as God. He will realize that he is but a man, quote, we know angel, but we get the idea that you are going to be brought to dust. The guarantee that angels are going to be brought to dust. The northern conquest, this is where It's a picture in which you have the northern conquest in Joshua, but it is a picture of this whole idea of God has to fight his enemy on the sides of the north. Satan is looking to take over his throne, and this is the Old Testament imagery of this. And It came to pass that when uh, Jobin, king of Hazar, heard these things, that he sent uh, Jobad, Jobab, (laughs) Jobab, king of Madon, the king of Simron, the king of Ashshaf, and to the kings were from the north. Okay, this is the kind of typified in the war of Satan against God. In the mountains, in the plains of Chinneroth. In the lowland, in the heights of Dor on the west, to the Canaanites in the east, in the west, the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites. This is all like Gog and Magog and the armies in which Satan is now rallying against God. And you're going to see that on earth. Before the coming of Christ, and then you're going to see a 2.0 of it at the uh, second resurrection a thousand years later, right? So basically what you have here, it says below Hermon, the land of Mizpah, which is Egypt area. Here we go. And they went out, all their armies with them, as many people as the sand that's on the seashore and the multitude, with very many horses and chariots. That picture is also, and that imagery is also picked up in Revelation 20 when it's the second resurrection. The wicked now are listening to Satan and are joining him as their sycophants all over again, the flying monkeys, now doing the bidding of Satan, thinking that they are going to go to war with God. And it says that they are as the sand of the sea on the seashore and the multitude, the very many horses and chariots. When all these kings met together, they came and camped uh, together at the waters of Merom to fight against Israel. But the Lord said to you, Joshua, Yeshua, Jesus, do not be afraid because of them for tomorrow about this time I will deliver all of them slain before Israel. So it is a type, foretaste, a foreknowledge. Fast forward to the second resurrection. You shall hamstring their horses and burn their chariots with fire. It is another rising of Pharaoh and his army, kind of a picture, Mizpah. And they're coming back and they're going to now defeat God because there's this big concept that Satan's going to play a comeback role. And God's going to say, no, you're going to lose. 
Satan is not going to give up this world without a fight. And you're going to see this whole picture of Absalom here. Absalom goes to war with David. Absalom had big, long, beautiful hair. Absalom hung between heaven and earth. Absalom is a picture of Lucifer. Absalom was the most beautiful creature in all the land. And he went to war with King David, who was a picture of Christ. He was a Christ role. And then he went and seized David's wives and humiliated them and raped them and then tried to steal the seed and the inheritance from David. Now, check this out. This is around some war advice that he gets, Absalom. Hushai said to Absalom, the advice of uh, uh, Hithophel has given is not good at this time. See, Satan is making his war plans now. For, said Hushai, you know your father and his men, that they are mighty men, that God is mighty. What do you do? Lucifer, are you insane? Why are you going to go to war with Jesus Christ? He's a man of war. Who is like unto God? You see, but this is the delusion you're getting through the scriptures and in, 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 in sacred history. You're getting the picture of how Satan gets deluded again and again and again. So it says, you know that your father and his men, it's kind of like the conversation that uh, don't go to war with God, the father. What are you doing? And his men, they are mighty men, and they are enraged in their minds like a bear robbed of her cubs in the field. God's a jealous God. Your father is a man of war. Sounds exactly like the new song. God is a man of war. Who's like unto the Lord? And will not camp with the people. Surely by now he is hidden in some pit. Hidden, how Christ is hidden in the apparent warfare. But when he comes out, he comes out as intwai domelo. He is he who greets with fire. That's what the name means. When Christ comes, Satan thought that Christ hid. In fact, God's people are saying, where have you hid? Where have you hid? Where have you gone? Have you forsaken us? God just comes around the bin out of nowhere with his riders and his horse and his sword and his wrath in some pit or some other place, maybe around the belt of Orion, I don't know. God warfares epically. He does it with resurrection and and his glory and the slaying of this and turns everything into melted a heap and then powder. Why are we warring with God? What are we doing? Oh, egotistical pastor, what are you doing? And it shall be when some of them are overthrown at the first that whoever hears it will uh, hears it will say, there is a slaughter among the people who follow Absalom, Lucifer, or anyone else who wars against God. And even he who is valiant, you might be a super clever, super tough guy. Brave to fight against God, whose heart is like the heart of a lion, seeking in whom he could devour. And what does it say? Will melt completely. What are we doing in our war against God? And Satan is more than happy to dupe people, to hypnotize people in a bizarre fantasy that you think that you could join him in his great rebellion against God and that it's going to somehow work out in the end. Delusional. For all Israel knows that your father is a mighty man, God. David representing in typology Christ, the strong man. And those who are with him are valiant men, Christ and his angels. Therefore, I advise that all of Israel be fully gathered to you from Dan to Beersheba, like the what? Sand by the sea, wartime, inheritance. This bizarre idea that you are going to prevail against the true inheritor. David, Absalom knew that David was given by the Lord this position. Like the sand by the sea for multitude, that you go to battle in person. 
So we will come upon him in some place where he may be found, and we will fall on him as the dew falls upon the ground. Didn't Satan think that it was a super cool, swift, and slick move to go to war with Christ when he's out in the wilderness, and he was defeated even when Christ was in his weakest state? And of him and all the men who are with him, there shall not be left so much as one. That's Satan's plan in when he goes fully to war with God and the remnant of his seed, and he's going to stomp them out, and he's going to make them as the residue under his feet. Anyone read Daniel? Anyone read Revelation? This is what happens. It is total annihilation that Satan wants. He doesn't want anyone to be a part of the foot of Jesus Christ because he doesn't want Christ to make this world his footstool. He doesn't want any thing here touching heaven and touching earth saying chess piece i'm not le left my finger yet he wants that finger off that chess piece so he could do a checkmate not so much as one moreover if he has withdrawn into a city like what the new jerusalem then all israel shall bring ropes to that city and we will pull it into the river until there is not one small stone found there. This is Satan's fantasy of what's going to happen at the second resurrection. Yeah, guys, guess what? We're going to go ahead and just pull these walls down. If we have to use our nails to pull down these alabaster walls. And we will seize that city. And somehow the knucklehead peanut gallery crew says, great idea. Verse 14 says, so Absalom and all of his men of Israel, like every child of wrath, like every child of darkness, like every son of Satan, the advice of Hushai, the archite, is better than the advice of uh, Hithophil. Ahithophil. For the Lord has purpose to defeat the good advice of Ahithophil, the intent that the Lord might bring what? Disaster to Absalom. Absalom, a type of of satanic rebellion, beautiful, powerful, charming and enchanting, able to really get like corporate support for himself. Okay, here we go. Sand of the sea, war and inheritance. Revelation 20, verses 7 through 10 says, And when the thousand years were expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth. Come on, wind. Come on, let's go. Gog and Magog, which is uh, kind of an Agag and his followers, right? The Amalekites. To gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. Wow. And they went up on the breadth of the earth, just like the advice to Absalom, compassed the camp of the saints about, and the beloved city, and fire came down from God of heaven and devoured them. Why is fire coming down from heaven? What's that imagery evoke in a Bible student's mind? They're being used as an offering. They're atoning for their sin. When God sends fire down from heaven, that's always when God consumes an offering. They've offered themselves to atone for their sin. Not a substitute, not a mediator. They atone for their sin. They're the presence of God, and they approached God, and fire came down from heaven. God consumed them as if they were an offering. Wow, God wins the war through this sanctuary priestcraft that he has? Yeah, it's called the vengeance of the temple. It's in the book of Jeremiah, the vengeance of the temple. God makes war through the temple. It's a sanctuary to us. It's a war machine against Satan. Destroy this temple, and it turns into a doomsday machine. I'll raise it back up in three days. Sport. Sporto. The devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire. Different sea this time, huh? <laughs> this sea I don't think you're recovering from, big guy. Brimstone. Where the beast and the false prophet shall be tormented there night and day forever, right? Aeon, aeon. In other words, until God has completely finished judging them down to the mwah, last penny. Every thought and intent will be gone through before they're brought to powder. 
So again, let's look at this idea again of this war zone, and you have the sand of the sea, and it's a preparation before entering to the temple in which this is the whole sanctuary imagery here. The labor is a picture of the desert, a picture of a mirror, a place of reflection, a place of testing, a place like a cauldron to bring the scum to the top, to purify and to purge. A great trial of moray. It's really called a moray. That's why it's on Mount Moriah in which you saw the offering of Isaac and this picture of Christ in Isaac where they ascend the mountain. He's carrying wood on his back. All he needs is a guy named Simon from Libya to help him out. And then he ascends and he lays himself upon the altar. And you're going to see here it's on Mount Moriah. And the word Moriah, a moray, is where you get the word looking glass, which is the labor in which you could finally see Christ through purging, through testing. Genesis 22, 1 to 18 says, Now it came to pass after these things that God tested. You'll see the theme of sand of the sea is here, you guys. This is testing. This is trial. Stand on the rock. You're on the sand of the sea. Sure to be washed away. Terror afflicted many days. All your strength has left you. You're sick for many days. You can't believe what you've seen. It's horrible. It's too big. Keep on looking till you see your husband, your Messiah, him who is your advocate and high priest, the mediator that you have between God and man. Keep on looking past the beast unto heaven by faith. And said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. And then he says, take now your son, your only son, whom you love. Why? I said to you, God, I just wanted to see the gospel. Not I want to participate in human sacrifice. Yeah, okay, you're going to see the gospel. No, no, I'm serious, though. Why am I having to sacrifice my son? Because it's inheritance time. He is a only, he's an only inheritor. There's only one inheritor. And go to the land of Moriah, Moray, vision. It's the word for vision or looking glass or to see something. I want to show you something. You need to see something. You need to look and to live, to behold my glory. And offer him there as a burnt offering. God, the three persons of the Godhead, what consists, what three classes of animals make up the whole burnt offering? You had the ox, which is a picture of the father, El. In Hebrew, you had the lamb, which represents Christ. I hope this is not too easy for you, this test. And then you had the dove. What do you think that represents? Who are these Who are these persons here? The three persons. The Godhead is offered to stand as our assurance of eternal, infinite, enduring righteousness, everlasting. The quality of the three persons, the Godhead, are brought in as a what is it here? As a burnt offering. On one of the mountains of which I tell you, which is Moriah, which is where the temple was built. Ornan's threshing floor ended up being on top of there. A lamb slain from the foundation of the world. High on a mountain, on a throne, on an altar. So Abraham rose up early in the morning. And saddled his donkey, sounds like Christ approaching the temple, took two of his young men with him, Isaac and Isaac, his son. And he split the wood for the burnt offering, and arose and went to the place which God told him. God sent Christ to be a sacrifice. God split the wood and says, let's offer him as your assurance of inheritance and righteousness so you could be as the sand of the sea. And then on the third day, third day, any parallels at all here? Abraham lifted his eyes, and what did he see afar off? Man, when you see Christ condemned and crucified for our sins, it just seems like that's just too far. That's just too far. Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. Lad and I will go up yond go yonder and worship. This was the worship of God. God, the Father, God the Son, the God the Holy Spirit had a worship service up there. We shall come back to you. I'll return again. 
with my reward, with salvation, with resurrection power represented in Isaac. So Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering, the three persons of the Godhead, infinite righteousness, the offering that Cain didn't want to offer. He wanted to offer the fruits of his own merits, like every psycho does, and laid it on Isaac, his son. Word Isaac, joy, laughter. Think Christ is not the joy of the Father? And he took the fire in his hand, right, an offering made by fire, and a knife, and the two of them went together. Wow. Father and the son went to Calvary together, guys. Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, my father. And he says, here am I, here am I my son. And he says, look, fire, your glory. The wood, the cross. But where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Adam sinned. We had to kill two lambs. Where's the lamb? You're the lamb. Adam says, wait a minute. These two lambs, is that going to be me? God says, no, it's going to be me. And Abraham said, my son, God will provide himself the lamb for the burnt offering. It will be the most costly offering ever in all of the cosmic universe because it will be God said unto my God. Discussions between the Godheads going on here. We're not in the picture outside of our representative Isaac. So the two of them went together to Calvary's cross. And they came to the place which God had told them, get thee behind me, Satan. Don't you prevent me from offering this sacrifice. And Peter steps back and says, what did I say that was so wrong? For such a purpose I came. Me and my father are going to make a sacrifice and an offering. Don't impede my work. Abraham built an altar there and placed the wood in order. Skip Pontius Pilate. Let's get Caiaphas, let's get Annas, let's get Judas. I'm arranging all of this. Disciples stand afar off. And he bound Isaac in the Garden of Gethsemane, his son, and laid, on, laid him on the altar upon the wood. Abraham stretched out his hand. Sounds Sounds like Eli, Eli, Lama Sabachthani, father, what? Took the knife to slay his son, but the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven, said, Abraham, Abraham. And so he said, here am I. Boy, where are we? Are we listening? Are we available to God? Does he bring us through circumstances that are unforeseen and it doesn't make any sense to us, but he's there to show us his glory, to bring us into sympathy with himself as to his offering and his sacrifice and the cost to himself? Do you think this is how we are bound to Christ is through this affliction and suffering with him? Or do we want to be immune from the process in which we are bound and melded to Christ through trial and affliction? Christ joined the three friends of Daniel as a son of God in that fire, walking around. Do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him, for now I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your son, your only son. I did not understand the divorce I was going through, I didn't understand why God was giving me no retaliation at all, did not speak up for myself in court, 
to not defend my reputation, to allow people to say things bad about me, to allow my ex-wife to have full demonic reign over everything, manipulating everything, getting the venues changed. I mean, it was like Satan was in charge of the entire divorce and custody battle. My entire reputation was destroyed out of it. Lies were said about me, people willing to believe those lies. And God says, don't defend yourself. I was living in Montana at the time. I'm driving literally back and forth from Montana to California, pleading with God, please, please, God, help me. I named my son Christian. I devoted him to God. I, I held him up before the Lord said, you take care of him. You take him. You guide him. And every single thing went against me. And even the changing of venues, even the custody stuff, I'm saying, what can I do? Every single thing that I'm doing, I am doing completely as you've asked me to do, and everything's getting twisted, and even the church is backing this stuff up. They have no experience of me doing what they're accusing me of, of being this terrible father and abandoning my family and cheating and all this other kind. It never happened. And I remember the last-minute venue. I'm driving 30 hours one way from Kalispell to Central California. I'm going back and forth, back and forth for a year and a half, going through battle after battle, doing everything I can to fight for my son, fight for my son. And God says, let him go, let him go. I'm like, I can't, I can't, God, you don't understand. This is my son. I'm weeping, I'm weeping. This is my only son pleading with God to try to appeal to his sympathy. I totally forgot that. This is exactly what God went through times infinity. Weeping, please, God, you don't understand how I loved him, how I cherished him, how I sang to him, played my mandolin while he's in the womb, how I did everything to give all the prenatal care, went to seminars and listened to tapes and did everything, 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 everything to try to be the best father that I felt like I never had. I, I made a million oaths that I've I ever become a dad. I, do every, I built a house to try to save the marriage. I literally built a home so he could have the best view looking at the Sierra Nevada, you know, on Fresno Dome and out by the south southern entrance to Yosemite National Park and out by Bass Lake and everything else. Nobody knowing the sacrifice I went through. Everybody hating on me and thinking the worst of me. And I said, I don't care. I love my son how I adored him and doted over him and how he was being swept away in this brainwash of this person that plays church and fakes to be a Christian, but has a lot of demonic stuff going on. And I'm saying, God, God, why are you withholding my son, my only son? I wasn't trying to quote the Bible verse. It came from the bowels of my being. And it was only then with tears streaming down my face, I'm trying to drive up in the mountains after 30 hours of driving nonstop as usual. God says, now you get it. What did you pray for, David? I'm like, what did I pray for? You said, show me your glory. You said, dear God, let me empathize with your heart. I did. I said those prayers. I mean, that was a little while ago, but you said, help me to see you and to know you and to know your mind and to know your heart, to understand my heart. You said to me, David, you wanted to understand my heart. Now this is my heart. Your son, your only son. Abraham lifted his eyes and he looked and there behind him was a ram caught in the thicket with its horns. Fascinating. A lot of great imagery here. We'll have to expound upon that in some other studies. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up for a burnt offering instead of his son. God's not asking you to make that sacrifice. He has made that sacrifice. He's calling for you to have faith in his compassion and the cost that he has made for us. And Satan is now going to make you pay for his narcissistic dreamscape, as every good narcissist does. And verse 14, Abraham called the name of the place, the Lord will provide. <laughs> God provides. And it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord, uh, of the Lord, it shall be provided. 
And the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time out of heaven and said, by myself. It's interesting. This is where you get the God can swear by no one higher than himself that he would make provision to enter into his presence and to lavish us with his eternal inheritance. This, I'm going to raise you, I've redeemed you from the grave, and I'm bringing you into my eternal lavishing, my opulent lavishing. By myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son, Blessing, I will bless you. Multiplying, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven and as the sand which is on the seashore. You see trial here? You see inheritance? You see gut-wrenching? Do you see beholding Christ all mixed, 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 and woven together in sand of the sea here? All consistent, and every single reference I make is going to be this process of Sand of the sea, seeing something, inheritance, Satan going to war, God prevailing. Totally consistent. Hey, Keith, Joseph, Shayla. Good to see you guys. Steve. And whoever joins afterwards. And your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies, and in your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. Harden not your heart, trust him, become a bondservant, nail your ear to the doorpost. So Hebrews chapter 11, verses 17 through 19 says, by faith, Abraham, when he was tested, stand to the sea, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son. This is, as I said, the battle will always be in the end. Do you have faith in the righteousness of somebody else? Of whom it was said, in Isaac your seed shall be called. Not in you, in Christ. In him who is the joy and the happiness of the heart of God, who is a well-pleasing, a well uh, um, my beloved son in whom he's well pleased, received of God, cherished of God, blessed of God, granted inheritance as now son of man. Isaac, your seed shall be called. You're sons of God according to what you are through imputation, through your faith in somebody else's reality at the right hand of God. Your reality is not real to God. It is a vapor and a fantasy. Get used to that understanding. Holy Spirit will help you to understand that. Concluding that God was able to do it, raise him up even from the dead, of which we also received him in a figurative sense. Triumph even from the grave. Satan is looking to play his own little resurrection comeback move. Okay, we're going to not take this. Um, we're going to take it in shorter chunks. So I'm just going to do this part of the scripture. We're going to go back to the Santa Sea thing here. We're going to go to Jacob. We're going to be in Genesis here. I'm not ending it now. This is going to be our... This section, and then when we get to, um, I think songs in the night right here, we'll part to it. This will probably be a three part, maybe a four part. I think a three part series, but we're going to end it right here at Genesis forty seven, and then begin it again as we're going to explore this whole imagery. I want you to become very well versed in understanding what God evokes when He's saying, "Let's look at the imagery of what happens when you stand on the sand of the sea, in which you're going to behold." You're going to see a primordial event happen. It's going to be Lucifer coming up out of the abyss and looking to establish his kingdom on earth. He sees himself as, quote, a quasi-creator, having dominion and ruling the entire earth, having the inheritance for himself, and no one can make war with him because he's now God and he has dominion. So let's see if Sand of the Sea again, and go do your own research just to evoke you studying the Bible, not just taking my word. Go and look at these things and see. Look up sand, see, sand, see. Look at all the references saying, wow, the whole series, he's covered every single reference to sand of the sea. And so it's obviously, this is the theme to it. It keeps being the consistent theme. So let us be ourselves evoked into understanding. That's the context of Revelation 13.1. It's inheritance time. And then 
hell comes because Satan wishes to possess that inheritance himself, and he's not going to give it up without a cosmic fight on your hands. And you have to know that we don't fight against flesh and blood, that our warfare is not carnal but spiritual. The issues are around righteousness and life and wrath and judgment and all the issues that should cast our eyes to the heavenly priesthood of Jesus Christ and the heavenly temple up in heaven that the whole book of Hebrews is trying to shove our eyeballs up in that direction to get our hearts to harden not our hearts, but to have faith in that reality of the Melchizedek priesthood of an everlasting eternal righteousness without beginning or without end in which we can have total dead confidence and not draw back from that, but to press on in faith, even though we're going to go through the trials of faith, the testings of faith, the crucible of faith faith, the affliction and purging and cleansing and purification and the simplicity and the dross of our stupid, wicked, double-minded, duplicitous, game-playing, double-agenda brain has got to go, got to go. Choose you this day. You're in the Valley of Decision. Genesis 32, verses 1 through 4, Jacob went on his way, and the angels of God met him. You want to come back home? You want to return to Christ? Name this ministry. You want to return to Christ? You want to repent? You want to come home? You want to not be a prodigal son? You went through the whole thing with Laban. You went through a cleansing. Laban means to be made white, frankincense, purging. You went through all that process. So it's time to come to the house of God, right? That's what Bethel means. But the angels met him, and Jacob saw them. Wow. Prodigal son coming back home. And he says, this is God's host, God of armies, right? Lord of, Lord of Saboa. This will come to play later on. And he called the name of that place Mechaniam, the dance of the double camp. Joseph, Esau, prodigal son, father. Uh, did I say Joseph? I mean Jacob, Esau, Joseph, and his brothers. Anytime you see this return to each other, and there's been a rift, and there's that process and conflict, and then the very rugged resolve that happens in that process, that what's important to understand is. That's the Mechaniah, the Shulamite in the Song of Solomon, who has denied him who stood at the door and knocked, but she never let him in, Laodicea, until he had already left and he was grieving. He put myrrh on the door handle, which is the word for to mourn or to grieve. It's what you like embalm dead bodies with. And he was crushed. That's how you get the quality of myrrh out of myrrh. To mourn, where you get all the Marys from, myrrh. Even the idea to marry, to crush, to make as one, to be joined in the crushing, mazel tov, break the glass, entering into his sufferings, deconstructing yourself, becoming bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh, entering into his sufferings, going to the valley of the shadow of death with your husband, with the bridegroom. Do your own thing. Uh, that's the harlot. Do you boo-boo harlot? Got to do me harlot. Got to do Christ. The virgin. Hidden in him, the virgin. Machanayim. The dance of the double camp. The very painful process, but it concludes with inheritance and oneness with tears with falling on the neck i'm sorry self examination jacob you have to learn about yourself jacob you have to learn about yourself joseph's brothers you have to learn about yourself prodigal son shulamite you're going to have to learn about yourself necessary if you're going to have the inheritance given to you you see sand of the sea yet? It's coming. 
Jacob sent messengers before him to Esau, his brother, and to the land of Seir, the country of Edom, Adam. And he commanded them, saying, Thus shall ye speak unto my lord Esau. I'm enemies. I have betrayed a birthright issue. My Lord Esau, thy servant Jacob says thus, I have sojourned with Laban. Laban, where you get Lebanon, it means white or to purge or to make clean. And God brought him through a Laban experience. Oh, man. He brought him through a very hostile household that did everything to Jacob that Jacob did to his brother. And he didn't like what he saw. Moray, Moriah. And he stayed there until now. And the messengers returned to Jacob saying, we came to thy brother Esau and also he cometh to meet thee. Wow, the Lord's coming. He's going to say, I saw the face of God. The one in whom I betrayed the birthright and I illegitimately gained it when God would have given it to me. He's coming to even the score. Yeah, it's kind of like what we did with God. It's kind of like what Satan has done. He stole the birthright when why steal from God what he's willing to give you? And also he cometh to meet thee and 400 men with him, kind of like the prophets of Baal, establishing something, establishment, institutionalized. Then Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed. You're going to see sand of the sea always includes this terror. And he divided the people, that's Machanayim, he's dividing into a double camp that was with him, and the flocks and herds and camels into two bands, and said of Esau, come to the one company and smite it, then the other company, which is left, shall escape. You'll see the remnant thing is going to start to build in this sand of the sea scenario. Inheritance, trial, war confrontation, and then you're going to see remnant come out of this. Dividing of the dividing of the sheep of the goats, etc. Jacob said, O God of my father Abraham and God of my father Isaac, the Lord which saith unto me, Return unto this country and to thy kindred, and I will deal with thee. And this is what repentance looks like. You're going to have to face things that you did, and you're going to have to face things that you don't like to see about yourself. And a lot of times we think, well, I went to Laban's house and I got spanked and I realized that I'm a knucklehead and that I did a lot of bad things, but you've got to go and face the actual people that you burned. That you burned, man. And you've got to make an account for it. You've got to humble yourself and not self-justify and just say, well, you know, they should just deal with it. I'm a Christian now or blah, blah, blah. I, 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 I've done good. I'm in ministry now. I'm doing righteous things. How dare you not forgive me? The Lord's not going to forgive you unless you forgive me. It's like, you're the one who created the nightmare. Go leave your gift. Be reconciled. Return unto thy country and thy kindred, and I will deal well with thee. Quit being a coward and face the very people that you've burned. At Jacob time of trouble. This is what we're this is next on, on the agenda, guys. And verse 10 says, And I am not worthy of the least of all thy mercies. That's the real attitude. That's the purging. That's the cleansing. That's the labor. That's the process of, of what we go through with the fuller soap and the great cleansing process that God brings his people to whiten the garments of his bride, Laban's house. And of all the truth which thou hast showed unto thy servant. For with my staff, I passed over the Jordan, and this is crossing the Rubicon, man, entering into the place where God says, okay, here it is, your trial and affliction, your purging, your testing, your fitness. Now I've become two bands. I've been split. Prodigal son, remember he came to himself? This is the idea that you're dividing everything and inspecting everything and you're seeing everything and you're making sure that there is nothing inside of you that has not been examined. It's called the investigative judgment. It's called what God takes you through before you meet the king face to face. It is necessary you go through this introspection 
where God is your partner in that process. And he puts his arm around you and says, we're going to have to look at some stuff and you're going to have to face the people that you burned. And they don't have to play your game. They can be mad all they want. You put them in the position of being your Lord. You don't rule over them. They rule over you. You're bowing your head to ask for mercy. That's real repentance, by the way. All this other stuff is a religious sham, a show, a prancing display. But it means nothing. That's not true repentance. Use the word repentance all you want. It's not the true thing. It's not the real McCoy. Deliver me, verse 11, I pray thee, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, he's going to submit himself. Satan is not, excuse me, Jacob is not bearing a sword. He was, he was hallowed out in his hip. That's what God's going to do. For I fear him, and he shall come and smite me, the mother, mother of my children. Is God going to strengthen him, or is God going to break Jacob to prepare him? This is something we've got to come to terms with. Is God eschatologically going to now give us all this power within society and within government and economic power and everything else? Or is God going to say, time to take away your loins, take away your power, take away your strength, take away your core ability to rally your core being? I'm going to break you, disassemble you. That's the preparation you need when the beast rises from the sea. And I'll divide an inheritance amongst you. I will fight for you. It's not about who will make war with the beast, who will make war with God, who is your defender. He's the man of war. Verse 12 says, and thou saidest, I will surely do thee good and make thy seed as the sand of the sea. Here we go again. This is always the context. You'll see it. This series will definitely get it into our membrane, our gray matter. It'll finally settle if we just put ourselves through this. Or please don't have to listen to my stupid voice or my dumb face you don't have to look at. Just go through and just do the homework yourself and look for this context and that'll be it. I'm just kind of taking you through it. It's just what the scripture says and having the Holy Spirit speak to you as you're reading through these scriptures and if we're going to get it clear in our minds that this is always the context of receiving the inheritance, sand of the sea, the deconstructive process, the storm that comes, the trial that comes, the introspection that comes, and being overwhelmed by your enemy in which God has to intervene. And he makes you look with great vision to something afar off, but true in Christ at the right hand of God, which cannot be numbered for multitude. Unseen things. Faith is unseen. Hope is something you hope for that's not there yet. Not feelings and sensualism and these things that we think, I got goosebumps. That's not faith. Goosebumps and faith are not the same thing. Feelings of being swallowed up with this feeling of a gopelol. Phony baloney garbage. Faith is shivering, shaking, and pleading for God to impute something to you that you can see in yourself. You don't possess it, and you need the mercies, the sure mercies of God. Naked faith, raw faith, true faith, authentic faith, sincere without wax. No baloney faith. I don't even think a lot of pastors I know, I'm sorry to harp on pastors, but this is the time of false shepherds and people seeking power and authority and influence and glorification. Most pastors I know don't even know what sincerity is anymore. They're all a bunch of postmoderns that really know how to fake sincerity, put on the sincere show. Squirt out the tear at the right time and to put the crying in their voice at the right time. <laughs> then they go and congratulate themselves at potluck afterwards. They go into their food comas. They kick off their shoes. 
And then they kick up the recliner. And then they're so proud of themselves that they were able to squirt out a couple tears. Hey, hey, dear. When I was preaching, did you see those tears I created? I created some tears. They cried. They wept down their face. I'm such, God, you're welcome. I'm such good preacher. You're lucky to have me on the roster. Can't wait to see you, but big guy, looking forward to my Cadillac in heaven. All right, verse 24 says, and Jacob was left alone. Oh, wait a minute, God. At the end of time, we're going to have a left alone thing? At the end of time of Christ, and that's going to be modeled, we're going to go through kind of a trial and crucifixion period of our own experience collectively. We're going to feel alone. God, why would you abandon us? You know my abandonment issues. You know my rejection issues. You know my terror, my fear of alienation. Jacob was left alone. That's a necessary moment you have with God when he brings you through this self-introspection, investigative judgment to search your own heart so you can finally learn that everyone else already knows that you're full of baloney. You just have to discover it, brah. You really have to learn it yourself. Now, that's my heart spanking for the man behind the sacred desk that endlessly plays games. But let me talk to the soul that's just struggling right now. When God is taking you through things that you'd want to see in yourself, it has nothing to do with how much God hates you. He's trying to tell you that the most ugliest thing that you're running from, he's already got, he already knows it. He's already atoned for it. He's already seen it. He wants you to have confidence in his compassion and in his sympathy for you and that he loves you. And he's trying to illustrate how he thinks towards you with the prodigal son story. Go to the throne of grace, throw yourself on the mercy of God, and he's more than happy to give it. You don't have to tell yourself these delusional kind of heightened ideas of yourself, and you don't have to sell your image. But to you, struggling soul, saint in the pews, man, when he is, God's not shaming you. He's covering your shame. All the mistakes we make in our life built upon self-loathing and, and profound insecurity and catastrophic loss of any self-respect whatsoever. Do what God does with that. He enters into a, quote, Holy Spirit, help me. He's coming as your counselor. He's coming as your comforter. And he's coming to, to fortify you in every single kind of sanctuary, fortifying um, pavilion. Kind of, he's, he's trying to say, you've got a place for a covering. You're going to be welcomed amongst the assembly of fellow humble sinners that have found me and found my grace and found that I cloak my, my repentant sinner troops and, and, and the lowly and the, and the poor and the, those that come hobbling in. I wash you and I cleanse you and I give you new clothes and I set a meal before you and I wash your feet. You know? So when I'm hard, do you know who I'm hard on? I'm hard on the people that Jesus was hard on, the clergy. Do you know who are the biggest babies, the biggest crybabies, the biggest twinkle toe, pamper me, pamper my little bottom, you know, with baby powder before you change my diapers, people? It's the pastoral ministry. Always telling you to pamper them. They're like the tyrants who wanted to be talked to in pretty little delicate tones all the time or they turn their wrath against you and play their politics on you. Anyone that knows anything knows that what I said is one zillion percent true. Verse 24 continued on. It says, and there wrestled a man with him until the break of the day, until you see, until the return of Christ, you're wrestling until the day Christ returns in the clouds of glory. And when he saw that he prevailed not against him, we need to lose to win. When we wrestle with God, God needs to defeat us for us to be winners because we need to come broken and defeated, pleading for his mercy so he can impute his robes of righteousness to us. The sonship that is deserved of Christ is now transferred to you and God sees you cloaked with Christ. So he touched the hollow of his thigh. That's where the loins are, right? That's where you have children. That's the Abraham thing. And it was out of joint. Do you want know God? Do you, if God wants to seal you from sinning, He has to remove your loins. 
you know, the way in which we give birth to sin, which we give birth to our rebellion, which we give birth to our self-justification, in which we give birth to our narratives, in which we are defending our just weird and warped kind of image management that we rush to the defense to endlessly, not just publicly, but even with God and ourselves. And then we run immediately to someone that's going to bolster up our self-image. And we continue to play this very feckless and vain and futile game that's only going to destroy us in the end. Lord, didn't I do all these things in your name? Depart. Didn't I do this in your name? Depart. But in your name, depart. You never allowed me. You never let me come to that point with you. You were never truly cleansed. You cloaked yourself in the best possible fig leaf suit that you could conjure up and you could design for yourself. You're not wearing my robes of confession and nakedness and authenticity without self-justification, without image management. God needs to put our hip out of joint. We keep birthing too many things. We're too good at birthing our little, our little costume party, a little cosplay LARPing party. As for he wrestled with him, wrestle with God, not with your brethren, wrestle with God, not with the people around you, wrestle with God. And he says, let me go for the day breaketh. Christ coming in the clouds of glory, day breaketh. And he says, I will not let thee go except thou bless me. Man, you had better make friends with God before he comes. Am I telling you something unbiblical? And he said unto him, what is thy name? And he said, you guys know, right? What does Jacob mean? You have to confess yourself. You have to, you have to just absolutely be honest with yourself. What is my character, you mean? The name, Shem? That's what the word name means, your character. It's the idea of your two front teeth. It's fully matured. Okay, you've, you're fully matured. What are you? My name's Jacob, Jacob. Jacob, what is it? What does that mean? Man, I am endlessly subverting, manipulating at the end. The whole heel catcher. We used to do it all the time. We used to always trip, walk behind someone, then kick their, their heel, you know, behind their heel, and they trip over themselves. You know, you ever tripped anybody? Well, he is the, the tripper, the tripster. Always manipulating. Always tricking, always finding some way to make you fall for his benefit. That's what every single phony baloney pastor and person in ministry does. You pay the price for their ego. They used you for their glory. And then they come out smelling clean. That's what Jacob did. He was, it says that Jacob was smooth and Esau was hairy. Esau was what he was. He was the outward, you could see the beast qualities in Esau. He was a hairy man. The smooth man, or he was a perfect man. That's what it is. And look at the Hebrew. It's the idea he was slick. You couldn't, you know, he was Teflon. Nothing stuck to him. He was a slick dude. He was a slick willy. Tricky dick. He's a greased weasel playing games. Always playing with the dials of perception. Still getting what he wants. But you, in the end, pay the price for his games. That is so not of Christ. You have to finally just come to yourself and just own the fact that you're Jacob, the worm. David, it's too harsh. The Bible doesn't say that. Psalms 22, verse 28 says, and he says, thy name shall be called no more endless manipulator. You finally come to yourself. Like I used to say, you want to learn to trust my brother, Tim? Don't listen to his, how he's reformed and how he's changed. And, you know, he's always in prison. I back out of prison, in prison, out of prison, in prison, out of prison. But every single, no, I've really, I really get it. I've really changed. I mean, I saw the light. I'm telling you, I've been to a million Bible studies, blah, 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 blah. I said, I, you will know the second to trust my brother, Tim, when he says, don't trust me. I can't even trust myself. I am the biggest manipulator. I self-deceive. I, I can't even believe myself. I start believing my own hype and, and, 
and uh, my own narratives. You know what? You want to do yourself a favor? Don't trust me. Let me prove myself without you ever trusting me. Let me build that trust back again by being a trustworthy person, not me convincing you with great stories of like this one elder I had to deal with one time, and he was a very abusive person. Like he was the head elder at a church, and I was also a fellow elder, and I was one of the only people that ever talked to him, washed his feet, confronted him, uh, uh, had the courage, but with tears and humility, but still like, brother, I got to talk to you. You're just, you're just a piece of flesh like I am, but brother, are you slapping people, you ruining people's careers and their lives because of your connection to the higher ups and conferences and stuff like that, that you could completely manage your image. You're a doctor, you have wealth, you have power, you have this overt, uh, uh sanguine personality, the fact that people tremble, people have literally had nervous breakdowns at the mention of your name and all that. I mean, he's had affairs and I mean, he's he's ruled with an iron fist. Everyone, he's a Demosthenes. He's he's ruled. He's cast people out of the church. He's he's done all of these these terrible things. And then so he really left a huge mess in that church. And then he was also he was a doctor who's addicted to his own uh, self-prescribing of, of pills and medication. And so he went to some conference in Atlanta, Georgia, and then supposedly had this huge wake-up experience and the hotel room went sideways and he wept and all this stuff. And supposedly he comes back from this conference in Atlanta, Georgia, this, this physician conference, and tells the church, I'm, I'm a new man, I'm cleansed. You guys all got to forgive me because if you don't, and then he goes even higher, he starts doing Daniel Revelation seminars, and he starts really promoting himself, and he gets a TV show, and on and on and on. Somehow this is all part of his repentance and humility. So he starts his nonsense all over again. The physical assaults, the sexual assaults, the yelling, the deception, the, poli the, the politicking the terrorizing of people, the control freak that he was, you couldn't talk to him. You couldn't confront him about anything. He's literally spit in my face when I'm like, brother, what are you doing? You know, like he would take over the platform, the podium. He literally terrified every pastor that was there, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it's this whole thing. We're supposed to like somehow suspend reality because he said he had some dramatic story somewhere. Therefore he's on good ground. But then again, where was the actual de the actual repentance? Other than we're supposed to believe in his hype. Don't trust me is the probably the person that you can trust. And God knows that. He's, he's tired of our games. He's tired of our renewal stories. And this time I get it. Like every narcissist. No, 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 no. Don't leave. Don't leave. No, whew. I really get it now. Wow, I really get it. No, no, I really, 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 really get it now. Stop this endless amount of, look, I've changed. I still need you to trust in me. Why don't you get real humble and say, I'm Jacob. I am a manipulator. I'm a deceiver. I play games with myself. And God's got to beat me down for 21 years just to wake up. You don't have to trust in me. I already know that I can't be trusted. So God says, oh, now it's time to change your name. And then he said, thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel, overcomer, prince with God, prevailing with God. See, you have to lose to win with God. And as, wait for, as a prince, thou hast power with God and with men and has prevailed. The irony of this. And what did he have to go through? What are we going to find out? What does it have to do with stand to the sea, right? right up here. Every time you get this stand to the sea thing, you have this process of purging and cleansing and facing yourself and seeing yourself and then seeing the face of God. When Jacob saw Esau, he says, I see the face of God. Jacob asked him, verse 29, we're, we're going to end up here in a little bit. Jacob asked him and said, tell me, I pray thee, thy name. He wants to know God's name. God's like, why are you so focused on me? Focus on what I've named you according to who I am. And he says, okay. 
And he says to him, wherefore is it that thou asked for my name, my character? And he blessed them there. And Jacob called the name of the place Penuel. Or, or yeah, Peniel. For I have seen the face of God. I've seen God face to face and my life is preserved. This is the necessary labor and cleansing and experience that we need when it's stand on the sand of the sea time. God's going to purge his people and he's going to use these trials to do it. And it's not going to play out the way that we want. And as he passed over uh, Penuel, the sun arose upon him and he halteth upon his thigh, leaning upon his staff, worshiping. Therefore, the children of Israel eat not now the sinew, which shrank, which is upon the hollow of the thigh, because it's sacred. God now taking your hip out of joint and deloining you, taking your core kind of way in which you birth out all of your, quote, familiar narratives that make up your identity, garbage, nonsense, the wheels within wheels that go in our cuckoo brain with all of its cogs and our cognitive process. It's sacred that God, it's, that's why right now it says it is hollow on the hollow of the thigh unto this day because he touched the hollow of Jacob's thigh in the sinew of his shape, of his, uh, and that shrank. God has to shrink our, quote, loins. He has to break us. He has to cripple us and get us at our core where things birth out of, where we give birth to things. And of course, when he saw him face to face, says, I've seen the face of my Lord. Man, we forget that it's a terrible thing to come face to face with God. We presume that God is just nothing more than a glorified Sandy Claus with a handful of candy canes in one hand and a bag of toys and rock'em sock'em robots and, 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 uh, P, was it P3 or what do they call those? P, PS3s or whatever they call those. I don't play those games. Not that I'm more righteous that I don't play those games. I've just never been interested. I should say, and he had a pinball machine there. I'd be going, ooh, he had a pinball machine. That's cool. So let's finish up with this. So this will be kind of where, where we wrap up our study. And we'll go Songs in the Night, uh, part two. So we're staying in Genesis, Sand of the Sea. The same process as you're going to know, inheritance, affliction, trial, testing, purging, cleansing, reconciliation, ready to go face to face with our Redeemer. Joseph's playing this role. Joseph's brothers, Mechaniam, reconciliation, sand of the sea. Verse 46, 49, 53 to 57, Genesis 41, and Joseph was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh the king. Huh. How old was Jesus when he was baptized and stood before the king? And his life was now on display to be the righteous life of men to be imputed to us, to live out perfect living before God under the law born of a woman, starting at 30, baptized at 30. Is there any significance to this? And Joseph went out from the presence of Pharaoh and went throughout all the land of Egypt. And in the seven years, right, of plenty, brought forth by handfuls. In other words, he had that vision because we're going into famine. Going, What is seven years of plenty to represent to you and me? This time of ease, this time of peace, Bible study, learning these truths, not under great trial. Even though my refrigerator has been broken for almost two months now, I have a little tiny refrigerator in which I'm still having food and I got a cool little house and I, you know, I got, I got, I got I'm, I'm okay now. But this is the seven years of plenty. Better be storing up these sacred promises, these precious truths to stand in that day. These are the years of plenty. Best be storing up. Get ready for trial. Get ready for famine. Get ready for when the money faileth. That will be in this study in the next part. When God tries and tests us where we cannot neither buy nor sell because Lucifer is now rising up as the great beast from the sea. And now he's going to enforce the image, which we know is going to be America, prostate, Protestantism, and this entire kind of sycophant to the papacy that Protestantism has become. And now we're going to be a part of a world order, a new world order, right? The whole socialist Protestant thing, social justice, 
liberation theology. <laughs> we are crazy, man. We're crazy. We're so blind. We're so en enchanted with ourselves. Anyway, um, we have seven years of plenty. It's not literally seven years. We're fine right now. We're going to be plunged into great spiritual darkness and famine. But that will pro that process will draw us closer to God and bring about difficult reconciliation process and self introspection. Verse 48 says, and he gathered up all the food of the seven years, spiritual food, spiritual manna, spiritual bread, do it. Which were the land of Egypt. This is this world, secularism, and laid up the food in the cities, the food of the field, which was round about every city, which he laid in the same. And Joseph gathered corn as what? The sand of the sea. This phrase is letting you know that it's around inheritance and trial, reconciliation, and reward. Very much until he left numbering. Numbering. And it was without number. See the imagery? It's there all over again. Verse 53 says, the seven years of plenteous that was in the land of Egypt were ended, get ready, Sand of the sea time, beast rising, come back of Pharaoh, come back of Nimrod, come back of Ham, come back of Lamech, Satan and his comeback crew. And the seven years of dearth, get ready, dearth in the land, affliction, trial, testing. Began to come according as Joseph had said, and the dearth was localized or was it in all lands all lands but in all the land of egypt there was bread guys this is what we're doing this is bread time this is bread time go back re-watch these videos not for my stupid face block out my face put in a picture of jesus or somebody else just go through the bible studies get immersed in the word of god see christ Fall in love with him. See him in the scriptures. Hear his voice. And when all the land of Egypt was famished, can we go in, are we going to go into a cannot buy nor sell, but rely upon God providing for us as, as miraculously as he provided for the children of Israel in 130 degree desert for 40 years? And the people cried to Pharaoh for bread. And Pharaoh said unto all the Egyptians, go unto Joseph. People being driven to those that have the bread of life, the word of God. What he said to you. And the famine was over all the face of the earth because of global warming and because of carbon emissions. Verse 56. Oh, I'm sorry. That wasn't the situation. Huh. Anyway. And Joseph opened all the storehouses and sold unto all the Egyptians. And that is where we're going to be spiritually. That's true revival going to happen under famine. Now the word of God is going to be a clarion call. It's going to be made clear to the minds of people. They're going to get it. They're going to get we need to be humble and broken. We need to be pleading for God to examine our hearts and to see if there be any wayward thing within us, any kind of twisted, iniquitous narratives that rule and sit on the throne of our hearts got to be cast down. And the famine waxed sore in the land. It's going to get worse for cleansing, for preparation purpose. All the countries came to Egypt, to Joseph, or to buy because the famine was so sore in all the lands. So what we're going to actually do, what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to stop right there. We're going to part two because we're going to get into when money fails. I already have a teaching on that. This has to do with sand of the sea. But now it's going to come to the right of inheritance and the trial that comes and the dividing of, of things and then the process of cleansing and then the strife and the war that comes and then the ultimate fight for dominion and then who has dominion. And then what happens to the loser? The loser is, quote, brought to nothing. Even the winners are brought to nothing. 
it is a brought to nothing zone. And that's what we're going to look at as, quote, the money faileth and the sand of the sea where it's a pulverizing. Part two, just to give you a heads up, is all about why is God allowing the pulverizing into sand? Why is everything but the rock going to be the only thing that doesn't pulverize? Why are human beings pulverized? Why are institutions pulverized? Why is our own ideas and our ideologies? And why are all the things that we've set up pulverized, like the flood story? Everything pulverized, our warfare is not just about buildings at this point. It's not just about nature. It's not just about our cities. The pulverizing is even in our narrative in which we have somehow housed ourselves thinking that it's a buffer zone against the Holy Spirit in which we have fortified our own soul through a semiological event. In other words, the process of signs and symbols and ways to kind of tattoo our soul with these little logos narratives that we have in our head. And God's got to break these very, very enchanted paradigms that's going to destroy us if God doesn't, quote, pulverize us, bring us to nothing. Very, very important to understand these things. All right. All right, guys, that's going to be it for our study. We're going to part two this and uh, go a little further because it's the end of days. You know it and I know it. I don't even have to qualify myself. Praise God that, uh, hey, blessings, Joseph. Always glad to see you here, man. Always glad to see you here. But this is what we want to do is pray for each other because all of this, is going to give us a right perspective and how to relate to when God's allowing the deconstructive, the famine, the trial, the testing, the time of trouble, the great Pharaoh chasing us, and you know, this whole idea in which Satan is looking to double down on his war against God, and then he turns to his seed. Those are going to be the inheritors, and you're going to be standing on the sand of the sea, and it's all inheritance language. It's all pulverizing language. And it's the, 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 the warfare of a beating wave against a shore. And God says, I've set my limits. The sea will have its limits. And Satan will only go so far until I return the clouds of glory and my children will be co-inheritors with me. Super fascinating stuff. These are the last days. These are things you have to know. These are must know things. These are things we have to be fortified in. Be careful of any man that glorifies himself. Be careful of any leader that glorifies himself. Be careful of anyone making the narrative about themselves when the only job we have to do is to make the narrative about Christ and Christ alone. Yes, continue to pray for this ministry. I'm dealing with some cancer stuff. I'm going to be having a surgery here at some point in the near future. You're going to see this big old uh, uh, area here with a giant scar and all this other kind of stuff. Um, let's pray for uh, one another. Um, we have a dear sister, uh, Deanna. Uh, she hasn't told me what it is. I'm, I wouldn't share it if she wanted confidentiality, but she says she's got some major, major decisions to make. It didn't sound like, should we buy the boat or should we buy the, the helicopter? It's not that kind of stuff. It sounds like some hardcore stuff going down. And so what I want to do is uh, let's be in the spirit of praying for one another, you guys. Be careful of thinking that it's, that God is so caught up in institutional institutions and buildings and denominations. No, the great cathedrals and the various denominations he is not caught up in. He's caught up with people that seek Christ with their whole heart, listen for his voice, obey him and come hidden in his name. And he is in the midst of them. That's the church. That's the church right there. Don't forget it. All right, guys, God bless. And thanks for being a part of this study. Please continue. Exchange some kind of a um, email addresses or something like that to each other. It's time that we start the fellowship from all around the world. I mean, people that send donations, I get donations from Netherlands. I don't get a lot of donations. There's about four people that send consistently. And I'm trying to tell you, I'm not even trying to get you to, I'm just trying to tell you, you would not believe the perfection of the timing. I a $750 energy bill because of this huge heat wave. I'm right in the middle of it, 109 degrees, like weeks now. I'm trying to tell you, God is going to step in and help you know, uh, in these times in which we're looking to be fortified in Christ and we need to be uplifted in Christ. We need to lift up one another. Satan is testing and trying everybody that is sincere. 
God is going to allow you to go through these alone processes, but it's not because he's forsaken you or abandoned you. It's a necessary thing and have confidence in, in God. You know, they talk about, you know, believe the plan with Trump and all this QAnon stuff. I mean, I'm not there with all that, but you know what the, the believe the plan I am caught up in the God plan. He's got the bigger picture. He is literally got this whole thing in his hands right now. He's not going to leave you. He's not going to forsake you. But there are necessary hum, humility um, that has to be uh, engaged in the most core places of our loins, of our soul, of our inner core being, that uh, inauthenticity and insincerity and putting on a great show at like false sincerity We can't prevail on that anymore. We cannot be Jacob. We cannot be slick and smooth and getting away clean all the time. God's got to snatch us up and do business authentically in our own soul. And uh, we're not going to be immune from that if you really want to stand before the king, washed and made white, new with the garments of Christ's righteousness, standing in the wedding. All right, guys. Thanks for being a part of this. Wow, the times we're in.